Hey everyone, in today's video, we're gonna be going through the ultimate guide to cold email deliverability in 2021. So this video has been quite a while in the making now, but I wanted to make sure that I had all the right tools, all the right resources for you guys to improve your deliverability and to basically handle 99% of cold email issues that you'll ever come across in your cold emailing career. So as I mentioned here, this year it's really just about taking preventative measures, okay? There are certain SOS fixes that we can go through and we'll definitely go through those in depth towards the end of the video. But the majority of this document is just about putting the right systems in place to ensure that this stuff doesn't happen to you to begin with. Because nowadays, email servers are becoming increasingly smart. They're becoming increasingly invested in filtering out spam emails. And a lot of you guys, if you're unlucky and if you don't put the right systems in place, you may be being marked spam, even if you're trying your best to follow best practices, right? Or maybe you're missing a couple things in this document that you didn't know you had to apply. So it's all about being preventative. And this document is also not just random advice that I just scraped together from, you know, unknown articles online, right? This is all stuff that I've tested, I've stress tested myself, and this is empirically backed by real data whether through my own appointment center team and my own emails or through my student group, which for context has a little over a hundred members now. And all of us are super involved. We always send cold emails on a daily basis and we're just very familiar with the most common sort of issues. And there's usually a recurring pattern where maybe you're just missing a couple things in this document that if you would have applied, you would have had much better deliverability. Okay. So this document is really, really in depth. As you can see, basically almost each toggle has its own set of information, right? So this is a lot to go through and I don't want you guys to get overwhelmed and bogged down by the details. So I'm just going to walk through step by step and I'll also include timestamps so you can skip to the appropriate solutions if you need to. Uh, and lastly, you're not going to have to really take down any notes or anything because I'm going to actually give you guys access to this notion document after you watch the video. So it's just gonna be in the description section below this video. So feel free to download it, share it, do whatever you want with it, and just have it side by side while you're fixing these issues for your domain. So first thing I wanted to mention, as I said before, is it's all about taking preventative measures. Nowadays, email servers are starting to use AI to become increasingly strict on filtering out spam. So it's all the more important for you to be very prepared when it comes to cold emailing. Okay, so if you don't have every single one of these things set in place before you send cold emails, there's a higher chance that you're gonna get marked down as spam. So just be weary of that, okay? So heading down to the first section, the most important thing by far is just checking if you have the right MX records set in place. So the most three most important records to have in your back end, so wherever you bought your domain and you're currently managing it, so whether it's uh, so whether it's GoDaddy, whether it's Bluehost, uh, chances are you're still probably hosting it in the same place that you bought it from. Just make sure that you have the right records in place, right? So SPF and DKIM are relatively more important. And then DMARC is if you feel like setting it up, right? So this is just, you know, if you want that extra sort of confirmation, you can use DMARC. So just a quick rundown of what these two do. SPF is basically a set of publicly allowed IP addresses that any intercepting server can look up. So for example, if you're using G Suite, right, Google will have its own set of IPs that emails are allowed to be sent from, basically. So if you have the right SPF records in place, any intercepting server can just verify whether the email is actually being sent from Google. And then similarly with DMARC, it's basically a signature rule, right? So there is a private key and a public key, and you're basically going to sign each email with your private key. So think of it as like, you know, the King's seal or like the King's signature, right? You're signing the email with the private key and then there's a public key available so that if anyone wants to decrypt the private key, right? So if someone actually wants to verify that your, your actual signature is valid on the email, they can do that. And usually that happens on the intercepting server side. So whenever you send out an email, they're usually gonna try to take the public key and then try to decrypt the private key to make sure that it's actually you sending the email. So very similar things that these two things do. And then DMARC is just a backup, uh, which basically tells the intercepting server what to do 
if it's kind of in limbo and it doesn't really know what to do with your email. So whether it's gonna filter it out to spam or whether it's gonna inbox, DMARC is just a backup, right? So that if it's unsure, it can give suggestions as to where your email should go and how it should be filtered. Now, obviously the intercepting server doesn't have to follow this set of policies. It's just that if it wants to play by the rules, it'll follow DMARC, uh, but it's just like a, think of it as like an extra backup thing. So it's not as important. Okay, so now that you get a general sense of what these three things do, it's time to set it up properly. So my suggestion is that you can actually just pay someone on Fiverr to do it for you. I wouldn't really recommend doing it on your own. I mean, if you wanted like the technical knowledge, you could do that, but I've tried both and it's just a lot more convenient to pay someone to do it for you because it usually takes a long, long time to verify. And then sometimes you have to give it 24 to 48 hours and it just becomes a little bit annoying at a certain point. So in my opinion, it's just better to set and forget and just to pay an expert to do it for you. Also, another thing you could do is do a double check as to whether you have the right records by just doing a quick Glock apps test. And uh, with Glock apps, you can actually pay uh, per credits, I think. So I think it has like a set of three and then like a package of like 10 or 15 or something like that. Uh, so you don't have to get the monthly plan. Uh, currently I'm on pay as you go plan. And as you can see the last test that I just did, I think like half an hour ago, uh, we had actually a 100% inbox rate, which even I'm kind of surprised about. Uh, realistically, I think you guys should be getting between a 70 to 80%. If you're within that ballpark, you're totally fine. Uh, just because some of these emails, like inevitably they'll get marked as spam at some point. So like, usually I find that Outlook is really strict. Uh, Yahoo is really strict and a couple other providers, uh, but you should absolutely be inboxing to all of the G suite and all of the regular Gmails because by far that's what most people in the business space use, right? So we're looking at the results here. We have a 100% inbox rate. And then on top of that, if you click sender authentication, you can now see, let me move my camera a little bit. Uh, actually, let me minimize this real quick. Okay. So you can now see that uh, SPF is set up correctly and DMARC is set up correctly or DKIM rather. And uh, this is actually not going to show DMARC because as I said, it's like a really backup sort of policy. Uh, but as long as you have these two set up correctly, you're totally fine. Okay. So make sure that this is in place. Uh, we can go through the sender score and IP blacklist thing in a little bit. Uh, this you actually can't really help because this is just from G Suite's uh, IP. So this is not like your device specific IP. Uh, but as I said, we'll go through this in a little bit. Okay, so after you've set up the MX records and you verify that it's okay, the next thing you can do is actually streamlining your copy, right? So before you even do any additional tests or send out any cold emails, you want to make sure that you're avoiding these list, this list of 500 ish keywords. Okay. So just use this HubSpot list and just really quickly go through your email copy to see if you have any of these keywords in place. Chances are, if you have stuff like, uh, you know, if you repeatedly use the word chance, for example, or, uh, you know, satisfaction or success and stuff like that, um, there's probably higher probability that you're going to get marked as spam. So you want to try to avoid these as much as possible. Uh, same thing with like increase sales, increase traffic, increase your sales, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you say revenue, I think uh, it's a safer sort of option. Uh, there's a couple different ways of phrasing it, but you just want to avoid these, especially if you're sending cold emails. You should also try to avoid excessive links and images. So my suggestion is that if you're sending emails cold and if you've never really had any prior contact with these contacts, you want to have a maximum of three links and then one to two images total. So if you're just overloading your emails with a bunch of, you know, random image thumbnails and you're attaching stuff and you have a bunch of links, it's probably not going to bode well for your deliverability. So you want to keep those to a minimum. All right. Uh, next thing you want to do. Okay. Actually, before we move on, uh, I also wanted to mention that an email tracker also counts as a link. So it's basically a tracking pixel. Uh, so you want to make sure you factor that in to the number of links you have as well. So my suggestion is just three maximum, uh, signatures can also have multiple links. So be very, very careful of that. So if you have multiple social links, I'd suggest just removing it as soon as possible because you should really only have your website. Uh, same thing with uh, signature image size and stuff like that. Okay. So next tip is to also be weary of your copy length. 
So please try not to send any more than a few paragraphs because if you're sending cold emails, not only do people usually not read super, super long cold emails, but it's just not good for engagement at all. And your engagement rate actually matters a lot when it comes to deliverability. Uh, that's probably why I had a 100% inbox rate here because I get a very high response rate off my cold emails. And I also have regular interactions with clients and stuff like that. So you just wanna make sure that you're not sending super, super long copy that no one will respond to. Uh, same thing with keeping things concise and respecting your prospect's time. And just to uh, give some context, all my cold emails are in between four to six sentences long. Okay, so really nothing longer than that. And then the last piece of advice for streamlining your copy is to make sure that you're not sending any sort of attachment. So you're not, you know, adding PDF files to the cold email. Uh, if someone hasn't requested anything or if someone hasn't responded to you yet. Okay. So the only situation where you're allowed to attach any files whatsoever at the bottom of the email is if someone requests it and if someone actually has interacted with you in the past. Okay. So if they're totally cold, you've never spoken to them over email before and they didn't request it, never send anything, never, never attach anything in your cold emails. Okay, so moving on to the next topic, you also wanna make sure that you have pretty low bounce rates. And a rule of thumb is probably anything under 10%. Uh, that's just like the approximate ballpark that I've personally tested and found to be true. So the suggested software to making sure that your emails aren't bouncing and that your email addresses are actually valid is a software called Never Bounce. So this actually has a bulk verify option where you can literally just upload an entire CSV of emails and it'll just go through and filter out all the ones that aren't valid. And then from there, you can remove it from your list and only send to the ones that are actually real email addresses. Uh, the thing with bounce rate is that if you start going above 10% consistently, chances are email servers will think you're just mass emailing this list that you never even bothered to clean out. And you're just kind of spraying and praying and not really uh, being aware of who you're sending out to. Okay, so just make sure that your emails are in fact real. And uh, also just make sure that you're only sending out to email addresses with the valid status and never bounce. So sometimes it's gonna give you accept all, sometimes it's gonna say it's not sure. Uh, anything like that, you just wanna remove and only send to the ones that say valid. So our whole idea with the whole bounce rate thing is just to be as conservative as possible. If there's even a hint that you think it's not gonna be valid, just don't send to that email and find another one. Okay, so next section is email diagnostics. So we just went through this earlier in the video, but let's go back here again and we'll take you through basically all of these topics. So as I mentioned, sender authentication is just the MX record stuff. Sender score, uh, this is just a proprietary score that senderscore.org gives you. So this, uh, I wouldn't really say you should give it too much weight because this is like not really a, a formal sort of policy you have to follow, uh, but it's still a good rule of thumb. And I find that if you have a high center score, it's usually gonna translate into a higher inbox rate. For the IP blacklist, again, this stuff, you can't really do anything about. So if you're using G Suite, chances are you're gonna get marked on these two blacklists, but that's just because G Suite has a bunch of traffic and a bunch of people sharing the same servers and you're almost always gonna get blacklisted on these two. So if you have backscatterer.org and dnsbl.sorbs, it's totally fine and it's not something within your control. If you have more blacklist, those are the ones that you should look at. Okay, so heading down to Google Spam Filter, uh, this is just Google's way of uh, telling your copy apart from spam. Uh, if it lights up red, then it's probably your copy that has some issues and you should try to switch it up. So whether you're using uh, different personalized first lines or maybe you have a couple of spam keywords in your copy uh, or maybe you can try sending out some dummy copies. So like random copy that has nothing to do with business. Let's say you're asking to meet someone over coffee in your uh, example Glock apps test. See if that makes a difference. Uh, if it does, then it just means that your current cold email copy just isn't good for deliverability purposes. Uh, this one, Barracuda, doesn't really matter too much, so we can disregard that. And then Spam Assassin, again, is just another way for Glock Apps to check whether your copy is spammy. And as you can see, 100% inbox rate on every single provider. Again, this is not going to be realistic. 
uh, if you get a couple marked down on Outlook or if you get a couple marked down on Yahoo, it's totally fine because the most important two to look at are Gmail, so non-interactive and interactive, as well as G Suite, which I think is somewhere, let's see, right here, okay? So as long as those all pass, you're probably good to go. Okay, so the next topic here is backup domains and users. So you wanna make sure you have at least two users within your main domain, and then also set up at least one other domain as a backup. So for example, with the branddive.com, I have a user for myself, and then I have a info at, and then I have one other one for one of my team members. It's the same concept here, right? So you want one .com domain, and then maybe one like .co or .io, uh, just a backup so that if your main domain gets marked down on a blacklist, you always have one to fall back on. Same idea with the users per domain as well. So one thing to keep in mind is that you don't just want them sitting there idly, right? You want to go through the same setup process that we just mentioned above, right? And we want to do that for each one of our domains and each one of our users. So warm up the email, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, make sure you have the right records in place, streamline your copy, and also make sure you're not sending out to invalid emails. And then also do regular email diagnostic tests on Glock apps. So this basically mitigates risks and provides you with handy backups in case your domain gets blacklisted. And then, as I said, just do regular Glock apps tests and you'll be fine. So second to last thing that we want to go over is warming up your email account. So before you send any cold emails, you always want to follow best practices and adequately warm up the account. So you never want to just set up this brand new domain and then just start sending cold emails right away because it's not going to work. Like intercepting servers will almost always mark you as spam once your first few days are up and you never want to go from like zero cold emails to like 30 the next day. So the first step to take is to just sign up for some email subscriptions. So whether it's like, you know, subscriptions from physical product, e-com companies, SaaS companies, news companies, you just want to make sure you have inbound emails coming into your inbox and your updates folders. Same thing with the dummy conversations thing. You just want to basically find five to 10 people that you know. And uh, most optimal solution here is to find a mix of business and personal email addresses and just start a random dummy conversation, right? So it doesn't really matter what you're talking about. Uh, you could talk about asking to hang out or go like on a coffee date or something like that. Um, doesn't really matter what the copy is. Just make sure that you have a back and forth conversation and that you know, you're know you sending out email and then they'll respond to you and then you'll respond back and just have this small thread going for all five to 10 people and make sure that uh, again, this kind of back and forth goes for at least a couple of emails. Okay, so this will basically boost up your engagement score. And then the last thing you want to do is to slowly ramp up your cold emails. So once you're ready to send, you never just want to send out, you know, go from like zero to 30 a day right away. You want to go from like zero to maybe five the first day to 10 to 15, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So the slower you ramp up in general, the safer it is. Uh, but you also don't need to go like by an increment of one a day, right? So if you stick to like a three to five increment, you should probably be good. All right. So besides warming up the account, we also want to make sure that we have emergency protocol in place. So this is the stuff where if you got marked down on a blacklist already, or if you're just still landing in spam and you've tried everything above, you want to make sure that you follow these three steps here. Okay. So engagement boost just means that you have the dummy conversation method. Uh, but that you also have it at a larger volume and a different scope, right? So you want to, instead of having back and forth conversations with random people with like personal emails, you want your target uh, desired types of email addresses. So for example, if you're sending cold emails out to uh, a bunch of uh, business emails who are, you know, e-com owners, basically, you don't have to have conversations with specifically e-commerce owners but you just want some that have a business domain. Okay. So instead of sending out to like, I don't know, Freddie at gmail.com, you want like an Andrew at, and then business domain.com. So you want to have those types of conversations with people. And then once again, you want to use any non pitch copy. 
So just to show Google that you have real, so quote unquote, real conversations going on and that you're not just blasting out cold emails without uh, any sort of substantial replies in return. So next step after the engagement boost is to make sure that you're narrowing down to root cause. Okay. So do an additional two Glock apps test, one of them with your pitch copy and then the other one with non pitch copy. And if only your pitch copy gets flagged, then that just means that Google or whatever email server you use just doesn't like your business copy. And that's the root of the problem, right? So either there's a bunch of problematic keywords that it doesn't like or a lack of personalization and you're just sending the same email format over and over. So that's, this is a big part actually of sending effective cold emails is to make sure that there's some aspect of personalization. So whether that's the first line, whether that's a slightly different call to action every time, you just don't want to be sending the exact same one. So make sure you're varying your emails at scale. Another last thing to go over is to appeal for blacklist removal if you're on any. So as I said, uh, these ones here, so the backscatterer and the sorbs one, you're never really going to get off because you're just inherent, you're using G suite and it's inherently going to land in those two blacklists. Uh, but if you're in any additional blacklist, you want to make sure that if available, you actually try to appeal for removal. And I've actually had a couple of consulting students before successfully appeal it. Uh, some of them are going to ask for like a small donation or something like that to expedite the process. It's up to you if you want to do that. Uh, but also make sure that you're not just waiting for yourself to get off the blacklist and that you're actually warming up and actively sending with your other domains and other users as well, so that you're not having this huge lag period of like a month or two where you're not sending any emails at all. So case in point, you don't need to pause all your outreach until you get this fixed. You just simply send it from another user at another domain and you're probably going to be fine. All right. So hopefully this video was helpful. Hopefully it gave you a lot more insight into what to do if you start landing in spam and also what to do to be very proactive and prevent these things from happening in the first place. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section down below. I'll be monitoring and see if there's any uh, immediate easy questions for me to answer. Uh, and you know, worst case scenario, you can always shoot me a DM or just reference back to this document if you have any issues. So hopefully this was helpful and I'll see you guys in the next one.